So thank you very much, everybody, for joining us this afternoon. And thank you for your patience. Um, we had a bit of a, a nightmare with the Zoom link um, and so had to set up a new one at the last minute. Thankfully, Stephanie made it. Yes. <laughs> Paul Ballot is having a really hard time joining him. He might be able to join us. I'm not sure. Um, however, I will kick everything off um by asking stephanie some questions to introduce herself and to set the stage for today's talk so view speaker view okay so i've still got a law society as the speaker at the moment can everybody hear me okay yeah i can hear you great yep, that sounds really clear. i'm getting yeah and i'm getting some thumbs up so it looks like everybody can hear that's great yeah it's difficult to tell when everyone's got the cameras off yeah <laughs> okie dokie so let's let's meet stephanie and find out who she is and let's hear a bit about her journey so stephanie can you tell us about what you do at the moment and maybe share a bit about your journey into the tech industry and what kind of inspired you to do what you do today of course so my name's stephanie stacy I currently work at Microsoft. I've been there about two and a half years. Uh, I work in something called customer success. And essentially, I sit very close to some customers across the NHS and help them to navigate some of the Microsoft solutions and offerings, some projects they're working on, uh, and work in a really collaborative fashion with uh, a whole bunch of stakeholders across a number of NHS organizations. Um, how did I get into it? Great question. So my undergraduate degree is actually in uh, English. And um, I was told by my by my family, who might be quite conservative by kind of Western standards about what they expected my job to be, which was that uh, it wasn't appropriate for me to have a chemistry degree because that was far too serious. Uh, and that being an English teacher might be a more appropriate thing for me to do. Uh, by the time that I had finished this English degree, I'd, write, I'd written my uh, undergraduate dissertation on uh, uh, appropriate women's work according to women's glossy magazines. It wasn't according to my mother, which is, you know, another take on it. Uh, and by the time that I started working, I went on a Sky Graduate Scheme. I was into data, uh, projects, analytics, pretty much immediately and never really left the opportunity to sit in the project space and to do implementations until now. So I've always had that kind of real interest in hard sciences. And then that's kind of merged into IT programs becoming so much more relevant and me kind of kind of phasing across from more probably more CRM type projects and ERP type projects to kind of the wealth of the Microsoft environment uh, and now I work on things like data analytics projects AI projects you know, really core computer science stuff but with um, with uh, Kaizen continuous improvement Lean Six Sigma human centric design kind of uh, principles kind of sat alongside the technical aspects of that piece because we know uh, ProSci who run the ad, have the ADCAR model found that having good change management in your project increases the likelihood of success of achieving your initial outcomes from 15 to 83 like, percent so it's, it's not that you can't do it without without actually helping the people like, there was a lot of people who would just go, oh, and you just do training at the end. Yeah. And you're like, what do you mean you just do training at the end? Do you remember what we did it for? And it, you kind of get lost. You, go, you almost get diluted along the way of, cool, who are the humans who we were designing this for? Firstly, what do they really want and need? Did we remember that in the middle when, you know, whether you're doing agile or waterfall, did you actually remember that bit and go back to those humans and what their actual need was when you carried on and you got stuck? And then at the end of that, I've seen people send, literally they went, but we sent them an email. So they should know that there is, they should have booked themselves on the training. And I'm like, what, what do you mean? <laughs> like, do you think maybe we should do a bit more than that? 
I've had people say, oh, but I, yeah, I saw a change manager once. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, cool. <laughs> so I, I think we are getting better, but there's definitely, there's definitely a strategic move more recently to get really, really intimate with the understanding of the human who you're trying to solve a problem for rather than yeah but they said we put, we rolled out this system so we rolled out this system it doesn't matter whether that button's there or anyone can find it as long as you go in the user manual you'll be all right like we've moved from there that is just dreadful <laughs> I'm very glad to hear that you've moved on from that and that you're changing <laughs> a different way of doing it. Yeah. <laughs> it's, I, I actually do workshops on this, uh, teaching people how to not do it that way and how to do it the way that includes people and how to think about including people in the design of their data and their data systems and their analytics and everything else. So, yeah, we have got to have a chat sometime. <laughs> so of course. Bal, Bal has given me some great questions here. I'm kind of thinking which one to pick next. Um, so actually following on from that, why do you think that the human aspect of the digital transformation is actually overlooked quite often? Why do you think that happens? I think, so when you're delivering a project, sometimes you will bring in a partner. Um, and some people will use a capital P and a small p. So they'll go, uh, like, is this a partnership or is this a technology partner who is delivering a piece of work that has a fixed fee on it and they are trying to deliver that for the smallest amount of money possible and i think you really need to be careful when you think about what you want to go out to tender for and what you want to use time and materials for or what you can bring in another expert to do and what you're going to get out of that relationship in a really transparent way, because it's very easy to say, here are the technical requirements, here are the, um, here are both the functional and non-functional requirements of this system and providing you do this stuff plus training, um, then it's fine, it will happen. And the reality is that people who are doing things that a possibly a more phased approach whereby you're getting to an MVP and then you're iterating on versions on top of that rather than do this big long project for years and then something will happen at the end and hopefully it's okay. Generally we get to a better result by thinking about the types of roles where we might want to use a member of our like skill up a member of our team to do that type of thing or think about the type of consultants we bring in or the relationships we have with our partners so that you're not comparing three quotes for exactly the same thing on the cheapest price which you know many people have to do uh, to do the other bits to do the human side of things and to do uh, both on the kind of what what is what are you trying to build for somebody and from the how are you going to get people sticky on the product i think you should genuinely consider like how you get those bits right without just chucking that on the tender for the technical bit too and hoping because the risk is they're the bits that they're the bits that some of the technical resources are less interested in and they're the bits that typically programs didn't use to focus on because fo because dev work used to be incredibly expensive and we didn't have the ability for a large language model to make a thing and we didn't have other people's code shared in github repositories and similar places and we didn't so we were always kind of paying to reinvent the wheel on a huge amount of cost for that and now I'm seeing organizations that are more successful in achieving the objectives of their delivery, looking at a more holistic approach to the entirety of getting there well, rather than focusing purely on the kind of, this is the tech spend bit, it's the only important bit. And I think if you've been around in these spaces long enough, I've been doing this 18 years, I've definitely had a, oh, I heard about user interface once type response from somebody. I'm like, yeah, cool. Uh, 
and, and kind of a dismissal of the value of some of that stuff. So I think, and I think now we're moving into a place where because it's been monetized, because online shopping became a thing and it therefore got monetized and abandoned baskets became a thing. And all of a sudden, retail and many other sectors have kind of fallen in line to a normalization of the importance of being able to navigate the screens and the systems that people are given. And I think the consumer space has it has demanded like that people go and ask in the b2b space that their systems are intuitive and meet their needs and they can navigate them they can actually find the screen i think i think as consumers in the b2b space we've become so much more demanding because in the b2c space people have done so well um, and then all of a sudden you turn up at work and you're like, that's not my system. Like that looks like something from the 1980s. And someone's like, yeah, crack on. Uh, we now are much more articulate in demanding that some of the systems don't look like that as kind of a community in the world. And the privilege of working at Microsoft is like, that we've noticed like, the ribbons have changed and changed on some of the products. Yeah, a lot of people live in our product stack. There are people whose entire job, they live within Microsoft products or 80% in Microsoft products. And those people have demanded of us that we had things that enabled them to do more work. And we've really lent into that. And as a result of us and many other tech companies leaning into that, in some of those products, it's then meant that things like our CRMs, our ERPs, our huge products have kind of followed that UI and got better, as well as I think the consumer space has demanded that the B2B space has. So is it just about the UE or is there far more to it than that? So I, I don't think I don't think it's about the user experience and the user interface only, but I think there's quite it's quite a useful example about how much we care about humans in a way that everybody can see. Because it I don't know if you were ever in a place where somebody gave you one of those enormous, uh, probably this thick, kind of like a yellow pages guide of an IT system. And it used to be the case that you kind of got picked to go on the training program because they thought that you were good or clever or special. Uh, and the, then the people who were good, clever or special or whatever it was that you had to qualify yourself for being important enough to get trained on this new shiny system that was expensive, got to sit in a room for a week and got talked at for 40 hours and then were expected to do the thing. And that's why you needed a book of this thick, because you needed a screenshot of what earth you were supposed to press next, because no one could remember. And I think the more that we've understood how humans actually learn, how humans actually remember things, how humans actually work in their day job, how humans want to interact with something like Netflix, the more that we have studied humans using computers, in all of those guises, including all of the accessibility needs that people have, because not everybody um, is going to want to use their voice or can use their voice to communicate with a product. Not everybody is going to be able to read and write in the English language. And therefore, I know that it's very Western, text very Westernized, but both of those things are true. And therefore, we need to be able to help everybody to live in a more equal society where everybody can have a place and be a part of something and they do the barrier to entry isn't the technology that they use um so microsoft are huge on that and that's been a really lovely kind of piece to be involved in and see and watch grow and see what's come out of it but i think we think very very differently now about the computer uh, project being a thing that will train somebody who's special and privileged and knowledgeable somehow, I don't quite know how we measure those, versus the reality of the world now where actually we want technology to include everybody and we want like we want it to be training less. You want to be able to pick a thing up 
and understand enough of the user interface because it's similar enough to most of the things you have that you can start kind of working out where to go or you get a pop-up that gives you a bit of navigation when you go onto a new screen because it knows you've never been onto this screen before and therefore if it isn't just like click the happy path follow the blue button that there's something around that so it feels like we understand that humans forget things and we understand that humans are imperfect and get, they get distracted during a 40 minute process and maybe the process shouldn't be 40 minutes so i think we've started to understand and build a lot of automation around things that enable people to kind of do less admin and get more out of it but it's a slow process and the future is only here in pockets so have you been using behavioral analysis to do this kind of stuff have you been using psychology or psychologists behavioral researchers or because it seems to me you've got a few different threads you've got transformation and change management you've got ues and personal interactions with the the space human computer interaction and ux um there is something underneath which is more design driven pure design driven do you bring in experts to talk to these areas? Are you using tools from these different areas of study? How do you go about deciding what you need to change or how you need to change something? Um, I think it depends on the project um, as to where the resources come from and who the right people are and what we should do. But I think internally in Microsoft, then we have behavioral scientists that come and work on projects and research because there's a billion people using the product stack. So there's a lot of people. And we were in a place where everybody's like productivity is just making people busier, just make people busier, make people busier. And we like 4x the productivity of people doing that, right? But the reality is we also increased the stress of some people uh, just yeah, as a population. And I think Microsoft's stance on this is cool. What could we? help people to do so that you don't get into that place of sheer panic when your boss is like oh but you need to go and do this thing you can't find the button like how do you make life easier for people who use our products um which is wonderful and i think that uh some of the other projects i've worked on in the nhs uh there's also that same desire so there'll be user researchers there'll be behavioral scientists that are looking at like core um systems to ensure that somebody is sitting there and measuring uh and the other thing doing a b testing the reality is that you can build two things and then you can test them uh, people are incredibly bad at predicting how likely it is that they need a feature on a system incredibly bad go and look at all the apps you downloaded because you will have downloaded something thinking you will genuinely use that every day and then you used it twice so the reality is the problem is asking users what they want because what we found out is they don't actually know so one of the worst things in user research you could do is go make a long list of stuff and give it to somebody as if just because it got said in the meeting, they must need it. And that happens both for your internal workforce and for stuff that you're providing for the public. So one of, one of the smartest things you can do, which is really simple to do, and it doesn't matter if you haven't got a behavioral scientist helping you and all of those amazingly brilliant people analyzing the data is build a minimum viable product as quick and dirty as you can. But, you know, consider governance and safety and all of those sorts of things put but at least make a clickable prototype of that uh, put it in front of the actual users and get re and, and what track their eye movements find out where they didn't click ask them questions and then make sure you make it clear that they're not stupid the system is stupid if they don't find the answer uh, and do that like do that actual research stuff if you are going live with a product and like a shippable product that you can do a pilot on, 
give them three days or five days to figure out a bit and get a bit more native and build a bit more confidence and then ask them what you should improve. Because that on something like a Microsoft form um, or a Google equivalent or whatever, whatever you want to use, whatever you can find or a survey monkey, whatever you can find that's cheap and dirty to get in front of them and just go, cool, can you just tell us all the stuff that you wish that you had? And then you can just aggregate that by the number of people who said a thing that was similar. And then go and build those things that the people asked for when they got stuck after they've been using it for a few days. I've seen people do that versus I've seen people wait. I've been on projects that have taken that are three year deliveries till you get to the first thing to go live. And the world has changed so much in the three years. But on some projects, on some softwares, it's, it feels so complicated to get something out of the door and shippable that it has taken years before you can get to that point. And I think you have to compress that window, get somebody something and get some real eyeballs on it and get some genuine responses to whether it's working or not as early as possible. You know, in contrast to that, I built a thing on Microsoft Power Platform. It's, it's a low code platform, right? Low code just means someone else's code. I built something in two evenings and showed somebody. Myself and I, at the time, I didn't code in any language whatsoever. So the ability to be able to make something and put it in front of somebody is incredibly important in accelerating some of this stuff. You can't iterate if you don't have something to iterate on, can you? And you can't reflect if you haven't got something to reflect on. Yeah, and that's just the basic tenets of design. You've got to do that stuff, haven't you? Otherwise, you can't design well. Yeah, yeah, no, that makes total sense. So um, I am going to ask one of these later questions. Have you got an example? Can you recall a project from the early days of digital transformation that left a lasting impact on you? All right, so... I remember when I was first implementing a CRM and it was one of those legacy CRMs. Um, I've been gold mine. Um, it was one of those real legacy CRMs. And every time I was like, but can't it do this? Can't it do that? The answer was no. That's kind of a bit like, why are we putting a software in when all of the answers are no? Um, and it was gutting. It was absolutely gutting. Um, and somebody kind of pulled me aside whilst like afterwards and was like, you can't be that negative about it. I was like, uh, you need your, your job is to be positive about this. And it was hard to find anything. It was genuinely hard to find any advantage of why this was happening to people. And I think. I was like, great, but I'm on this thing and my name is on it. I can't really get myself off it. And I've been told that I have to try and find something positive. And that kind of being in that tough place, because you know you're going to show this to people and their immediate feedback is going to be, oh, I was expecting there to be some element of betterment here and I can't see any. And me not just having a genuine, tangible thing that I could say to kind of rebut that because I actually, you know, there, there is evidence that it made somebody faster or this thing was a bit better, it was immensely frustrating. I don't think we're in that place anymore. I'm, I've never been asked to be in that place since where I was like, oh, it's going to be tough to get behind this. I, that like dealing with the resistance of users going, why would I bother to learn this if nothing's better? Um, and kind of needing to be like, well, we're taking the other system away. Apparently, like, apparently it's cheaper or something. Like, there's just nothing. And I think that's a tough place to be. And we're not in that place anymore. I've certainly never been asked to be in that place again. Um, and you've still got your but, job. <laughs> oh, it's, it's not the same job I had. I've been at Microsoft two and a half years, so most of what I talk about won't be there. It will be things that I've done in my kind of previous existence. Um, but it was definitely, it definitely wasn't an incentive. I think it was on a Mac cover. It definitely wasn't an incentive for me to then go and 
want to work for them like on a permanent basis and potentially be in a role where I'd have to do that again. <laughs> you can't be human centric if you're not actually allowed to respond to the humans, can you? <laughs> Yeah. So that, on that on that one, how do you think organisations can better integrate human centric design into their digital transformation strategies? I think there's two key places that humans really have to play a part. One, which is very well researched, is working out what it is that needs to get done and going and doing like proper process mapping but asking the difficult questions and seeking to understand why, because it's often that you go and you work on something in one department and you find out that they do these nine other things that seem completely illogical that they're doing. And they're doing them because someone in some other department doesn't have a field in their system or uh, there's another broken process somewhere else. And someone's kind of just adopted that as a, Kind of a workaround and until you start to kind of peel back those layers as well as continue to ask what what is the art of the possible like what is the dream what is that complete goal of what you would like this to be like and then go back and wonder how much of that is magic and how much of that actual computers can do now because we've come a long way with api integration We've come a really long way with people making some really intelligent systems um, and automation. And it's a huge shame sometimes that people don't. Um, Agentic, great example. So we went from LLMs now to LRMs last week, uh, which now gives us the possibility to kind of have a manager of a whole bunch of bots that can do different things. So we didn't used to be able to ask ChatGPT or another LLM agent, what is the time and date now? Because it didn't understand. Now you could you know, add a clock bot, which means if you need to do something like, say you want to let people book an appointment out of a choice of a calendar of appointments to see a particular medical discipline practice within a, a particular service. So say that you live, I don't know, you live in Buckingham and you need to go to the eye hospital. So how can you just book your one appointment without having to wait till tomorrow to talk to somebody? In theory, if you can ask an agent 24 seven, what is the time and date now? And then it understands that you add a plus. So plus it has to be the next day maybe is the request. Um, then and it has to be one of these three clinics because it knows where your postcode is and therefore this would these would be viable options and you let people choose one of those and then you serve up all of the available appointments with the right clinician type so say there's three people and you just give them the boxes of the the next three opportunities or they can click and expand that out and choose an appointment that stuff's all completely possible and yet that is not my experience of using the nhs even though I know that that's completely possible, and it is some people's experience of using the NHS, um, the reality or other healthcare services, the reality for some people and how digitally mature some parts of the system are versus others isn't the same. If I want to go and make an NHS appointment at my GP surgery, I will be very lucky if they pick up the telephone. I'd be best to go drive over there in the afternoon when they've already done the day's appointments and go and ask somebody if they could help me out. Um, and th so that juxtaposition between what is possible, what, where we'd like to be with enabling people to have freedom and choice and do things when they've got their own downtime and like some of the restrictions of the complexity of some of the organizations that we have uh, and the willingness of some people to let you do the thing um, is complicated. But it's not hard to imagine what it, what good looks like in things that consumers use. I think we could all articulate what we'd like, what we'd like to have. We'd like to just have the choices that we often have in the B2C space in our B2B jobs. 
in our public services. Like we'd like to have some of the stuff that we've already seen somewhere in a pocket. Like we'd like to have as much choice and freedom to choose the the easiest method for you at the time to kind of do the thing that you need to get done. You bearing in mind the accessibility needs that you have, and then you just need to work out what are all of the things you therefore need to build. And it's so often that we expect that a user interface has to look like a web page, or it has to look like a form. It has to look like it has to look like a form someone used to print on a Word document because that was what it was. So why on earth would you be imagining something that someone can speak to? And then all of a sudden we have stuff just like coming in from everywhere now so fast that it's making the, oh, wouldn't it be cool if you had that stuff way more possible? So we've kind of moved in just the last two or three years to a place where somebody's like, oh, do you want it to translate from any language in the world? Like a spoken or written? Cool. What do you want? What What's the next step? Like people will just nod and go, "Yeah, cool." I'm seeing banks do that all the time. Oh, got a chat bot. Cool. All right. Yeah. Use any of the known, like any of the, any of the larger languages that people are using in the world. So any like national language, in the entire world, crack on. Which is worlds away from like getting that big user manual that only came in English and hoping for the best. Absolutely. So I'm kind of, I'm a bit torn on these questions here. I'm going to let you choose one. So <laughs> yeah. um, one of them really fed into that, which was sharing an example of how AI has transformed ideation, which actually feeds into what you'd love to do, but what you have been able to do would be kind of interesting to hear about. But the other one is how can power platform be leveraged to enhance the human centric design in digital transformation projects? And I'm kind of, I like both of those. We can tackle both but, um, together. Oh, yeah, go tackle for both it. Together. So. <laughs> oh, and before you start, can I just say to people, if you've got a question, can you please pop it in the chat and then I can ask Stephanie your question or ask you to ask Stephanie her question. Thank you. Cool. So, the, so I'm guessing everybody has some awareness that Microsoft Power Platform is a low code offering. There are similar things out uh, in some parts of the market. Um, because of Microsoft's strategic investment with uh, OpenAI, then the ability to uh, iterate fast on some of that stuff tends to go quicker in Microsoft. So uh, we've got a couple of things that are both AI and Copilot. Um, so announced recently, maybe two weeks ago, uh, Bala might jump in and go one week ago. Uh, there was, there's, we've now got an Oh, he's here. An agentic um, kind of solution in what we used to call Power Virtual Agents that's now called Copilot Studio. So the ability to do cool things like rather than you can ask an LLM one question and then you could do a thread and ask it another question related to your first question and then maybe three or four or five if you're lucky before it crashes. Uh, that was cool, but actually the agentic thing gives you the possibility to do stuff like let it agree to let it and you'd have to do some build stuff go to your email and understand that if I'm writing an email to somebody else and that the end of their email address is at microsoft.com it means they're internal and therefore look up the internal example responses that I've already sent to similar questions and draft a response it's a co-pilot and you 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 remain in charge so it's not an autopilot it's not just gonna send the email for you that would be pretty scary um but if you think about people who like have a shared mailbox now and they actually get a thousand of the same question uh, and all of those email addresses are from members of the public then it would be useful to be able to go through and go cool there's five parts to this question here are the five relevant kind of chunks of text from the things that you fed it. So it might be this approved web page, these three documents and anything else I've used before might be kind of built into the response set that you have. And then you've got a set of drafts and then it would learn from you editing the drafts more of the nuance of that conversation. But if you think about the ability to 
understand in your organization from the Microsoft graph who reports to who and therefore that that's your boss's boss and you might not respond the same way as you would your peer uh, so if it's your peer cool but if it's you know if it's your CEO I may, maybe there's a different way of wording things so it might be able to understand that stuff from the Microsoft graph and it might be able to understand like look up your customer list from your CRM because you've allowed it to view that those people are customers. So it would know the difference between an organization contacting you that isn't a customer that might be trying to sell something to you, for instance, an organization that is an existing customer and that person might also be in your CRM and somebody who is like your peer and somebody who is your big, big boss in order that it's drafting a response that's more in the tone of the language that's used, but also saves you a lot of, oh, I need to go and check that one thing there from this other, this other set of data about how long the waiting list is on that one product. Because in theory, it could do a whole load of that stuff for people. And that both sits in the power platform and uh, AI. And the other thing that's super cool that's coming slash come is the private preview of allowing people to write a nat or say a natural language question and get back from Power Automate or um, Power Apps an app, a built app. <laughs> from their natural language question. And in, I'm not going to say that all of those are going to be absolute fire. You could just go and use it. No need to even check it. It's not going to be that initially. But the barrier to entry, like we used to talk about system developers, and I don't think we need to talk about those anymore. There's people who, are, who can use that tool, people who can ask a large language model, say, like GitHub Copilot, to produce a piece of code and paste it in. And then people who can go and fix the problem when something is generated. It feels like, you know, if you think about communication and written communication, it used to be that there were authors and journalists were the only people who could ever share something to the masses. And now there are spoken word poets that just blow up on Instagram. And there are people that will write an open letter to a politician who's just a member of the public who millions of people will see. And that kind of shift has happened. I think that will happen in the dev space or is happening in the dev space, whereby you don't become an expert by using the tool, but you can help it, you can enable you to become an intermediate user relatively quickly versus, versus where we were maybe a couple of years ago. So I think I think we're closing that gap. So when we talk about citizen developers or people that go and build a thing on Power Platform that's relatively simplistic when they didn't have tech skills, I think that's going to go from being the odd super keen person who will lean in and figure it out because they need to, like I had done, to being much more normalized. Like it's if somebody goes, oh, I did this thing in Excel, it, it doesn't have to be on your job description. Every, like we expect that almost everybody in a back office role would be able to use Excel to some extent. We expect, I think, in the next few years that almost everybody would be able to do some of this stuff to some extent. Does that mean we need to start teaching it in universities then? I'm aware I'm not the only um, academic in the room. I can't I can't recall a secondary school where nobody has ever suggested that a student went and learned Python like it's mm. quite common in school for people to have noticed that some of the skills are useful and I think somebody asked I think it's someone asked Sam Altman this question and I think he was a bit like it's useful to understand how to write code so that when you see these things happening, you have a better understanding. But there's also the flip side of that is you almost don't need to be, you almost don't need to be able to write the code to understand it. Because some of the tools you can say, what does this piece of code do? And someone go back, oh, the second line means this, the third line means this, the fourth line means this. 
So it's become much more accessible for somebody who hasn't been on a boot camp, who hasn't got a computer science degree to enable them to get some of the basics quicker and enable them to do more without some of the basics. So I think you can go much faster into it. And I think that's why we're kind of avoiding this kind of in low code, we have citizen developers because I think everybody's going to gradually over the next five or 10 years in mostly in core core roles. Uh, so like what we used to call central services or back office, I think most people will have some understanding in the same way that everybody in marketing and comms and a lot of people in HR have a really like have a really clear ability to go and put a share point page or a web page together. Like you don't see those people go, oh, I've got no one. I could never use HTML. They go, oh, and I pop into there and the HTML thing pops up. And even if they don't quite grasp that HTML is language or CSS, what that means, they're actually going and learning those things because the tools enable them to go on that journey. I think lots of people will go and edit a SharePoint page in the modern world. And 15 years ago, there was a, that was a really important role with a crown. You know, that wasn't everybody. And I, I just think there is kind of a, a leaning towards the need to be able to use more of more of the core dev tools across other people. I think we thought Excel was going to mean there were never there were no more accountants, and that didn't happen. So I don't think that just because we've got some of the tools that everybody's job is going to completely change, but I do expect that it will become more normal for particularly people who are in some of the spaces that sit close to techies and wished that they could do some of the bits to actually have a bit more freedom to do some of the things. I'm intrigued. I've, I've got a great question of Sam here, but just before I ask his question, to very briefly, you probably um, locked down a bit on confidentiality on this one. I'm intrigued because you mentioned Lean and Six Sigma in your right, preamble and that you're doing a lot of this in the NHS. So how are these kinds of platforms and these sorts of abilities helping you to do that work? How are these two things kind of coming together? I think when you learn a tool and it's in your toolbox, it's hard for it to not come out, if that makes sense. So lots of us have learned things like how to do an Ishikawa fishbone diagram or how to use the five whys technique or in order to do some root cause analysis or um, how to like avoid logic traps because we were trained to do it. And it became normal and it was part of the culture. And then we will keep that mentality because we've seen that going through this process is like results in better kind of agreed design ideas, um, better scoping, um, better process maps. And therefore, we know that as a result of that, the end product is better. So I think I think it's one of those things that, much like ProSci with the change management piece, once you've learned it, it is just part of your DNA. And by default, um, you will, like, you'll, you'll kind of just take those tools and be like, oh, so are we doing this? And you might check with somebody else, are we doing this thing? Or would you, would you like someone to run a workshop to do these things? Um, so looking at those things or looking at pestle analysis and understanding where it's gone wrong before, I think is a really easy kind of way of keeping some of the stuff that will get you so much further along kind of to the front of your mind. And the other thing that I think is critically important in some of these spaces is um, going to the Gemba, like being in the problem. And I think I built a thing a long time ago uh, and it 
a decimated waiting lists during COVID in a particular condition in a particular part of the country. And I started getting thank you cards sent to the person that sent the text message. It was the power app. And the reality is that once someone sends you a thank you card for saving their life, and then you get another, you realize that the thing you did had huge impact. And the reality of why that was different to people who are much more capable on these tools. I literally, I literally picked it up and used it. And two days later, I had a thing. And the reality is I was closer to the problem. I was, I was the IT director for the org and someone was very emotional about the sheer number of people in the waiting list and the likelihood that they can't stay there for very long because they're not very well. And I, the frustration of that and the yeah the frustration of that meant that I could just quite quickly do something um was completely game-changing and sometimes we forget that as is and to be process maps going to the Gemba doing deep dive workshops like all of those rich resources that you can buy a book on this. You don't have to go on a course. You can go on a course, but you can just pick up a book and read it or go find an article on some of this stuff and work out how to do it. Is that if you can get close enough to the problem and you can go through some of these processes, like Toyota demonstrated that they built better cars because of this. Like there's a lot of evidence both in that and Six Sigma for service that this stuff works sometimes remembering to go back to that stuff or learning about some of that stuff is the difference between making a hundred power apps. I know people who've made a hundred, I know organizations that got more than a hundred different power apps. And if I ask them what, like what's been the impact of that, they don't know. They can't tell you because there probably hasn't been that much. And then there are organizations and people who are just like, you did what? You made a thing and it had this impact. Oh, yeah, and it took me. And they'll be like, oh, it took me so-and-so number of hours. And the difference isn't technical excellence, far from it. The difference is actually understanding how to get to the crux of the problem. Yeah, so lean and lean management is a suite of design tools that help us do the design part of it better and help us interact with humans better because they're very well-worn, well-tried and tested tools, aren't they? They've been very successful in a lot of different spaces. And of course, now we're working more towards this idea of lean, conceptual lean, as opposed to very rigid, discrete manufacturing lean. And that therefore it's working in the NHS and places like that, which is just fantastic to see. Yeah, I, I'm totally 100% on board with the lean tools, I have to say. Now, I feel a bit selfish now because I've had this conversation for quite a while. So um, I think it would be nice to throw it open to the floor. Now, we have a question of, of Sam, Sam Weaver. Would you like to ask your question, Sam? I'll see if it works. I've got appalling Wi-Fi today, I'm afraid. Okay. Um, it's really interesting hearing about all the sort of uh, access to all these tools. So I work in an industry where there are a lot of issues with sort of access to data and privacy and data. So my question was sort of two, was around, there's, there are clear benefits to having the ability for people to be citizen devs, as you say, or for people to be able to prototype tools rapidly and rather than having to spend huge amounts of time generating things that don't work as someone who's done that a lot. Um, but how do you balance that, particularly with customers where there's uh, sort of privacy or access issues with the sort of financial barrier that can be presented to entry or to remaining competitive um, and the issues of the fact that there is a need for content to train tools to do these things? That's a great question. There are. And I think the NHS is a great example because actually you've got some of the most sensitive data that you and all of us have got some of our most sensitive data in our NHS records um, and the stuff, you know, I don't want other people to have access to. So working out how to pseudo anonymize data so that you can get a larger data set uh, in a secure data environment so that someone could ask a question of that data set without ever having any access to a copy of it, let alone the raw data, let alone even if they watch somebody walk into that service, 
being able to track that back to understanding what medical condition that person might have had because you know the day they visited. So you know, there's a whole load of kind of security and like safety principles that have to be wrapped into that. Um, interestingly, Microsoft used the default on rather than the default off to allow people to make power apps uh, and power platform solutions. So providing that your organization didn't default it off, you could at least build the conceptual idea of something, which for smaller organizations like where I was, was amazing because it meant I didn't have to go and ask someone to switch the thing on or pay before I made a prototype of something. I could go and make it and then ask for a license once I'd shown it to somebody. Um, and the pricing for some of those in, I was in uh, an organization that's actually a registered charity at the time. So the pricing in the public sector and the pricing in charities of some of those things for a single user license or a very small number of licenses can, can enable people to get a yes quicker. Obviously, you still need to do the good governance stuff of understanding whose data it is, what it is, what it means, where it goes, who's got what controls over it and how safe it is. You definitely still need to do that process. So you still need to get someone to allocate a license, which probably means it still needs to go through a change advisory board. But the barrier to at least being able to prototype, like to draw out the process map and then at least be able to get a well this is might be what it kind of looks like saved in an environment that isn't your live environment is i think the closest we can get to helping somebody else in another organization at least be able to take their journey but obviously the larger the organization you work in the more complexity that presents and i think moving away from that citizen dev model makes a lot of sense because it means that actually ideation versus cab and kind of decision making and iteration and backlogs you can kind of play out the what should we make rather than somebody magically convincing someone that you can have one license and not quite understanding what they did make and then retrospectively working it out so i think so there's a challenge right you're, be you're better off with things on the open market than the black market, I've heard somebody say. Like, if you didn't have any of this, then somebody will just go spin up a, they'll be in an M365 space and they'll spin up a private, like, Google sheet on their own G personal Gmail account and start gathering data. And I've seen that in fairly chunky charities in the world that I've worked in. Um, and I'm like, sorry, you what? Oh, I didn't even realize that I'd logged in. Yeah, that's where the things are. Uh, and, you know, that's a whole other space. So giving them, giving people at least some of the awareness and the ability to at least kind of prototype things in a place where it's likely they're going to have to go through a change of advisory board is probably the best place we can be in as a provider to help you with that on both sides one i've got this idea and i wish it had come to life and i'd really like to get someone on board and the other i'd like to do really really good governance and make sure our data is safe like both of those parties get some of what they need by kind of the default on setting so if you've got an m365 account by default you can go and teach yourself some of power platform and save something that you can then go look it would it would kind of be like this, if that makes sense, rather than having to use a clickable prototype software to build something like a series of screens in Figma and then pull it into something and make it make almost like a computer game of what you wish the system would look like first in order to get sign off. Sam, does that help? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, it, it's really interesting that, that, that it's defaulted on. I think the, the issue, there are so many configurations of 365 now, at least at least there seems to be across organisations. But yeah, it's really interesting. I think like the, the transparency in what's being used where is really important because that's what, so, so I, I came from clinical sciences to consultancy and the big issue you always had was trying to get people to understand 
that everything's anonymized and that that what that is being used for. So um, I think that's the thing that sort of drives me forward in when I'm thinking about human centered design and when I'm working around AI trustworthiness and those sorts of things. It's like trying to understand where the limits are of people's comfort with what's being shared. Um, but yeah, around reducing barriers, it's really interesting that you could you can essentially trial things because that's a big issue with a lot of the GPT-4 orientated tools is that they are so limited in the iteration you could do. And the other thing that I would seriously consider, I mean, Microsoft are incredibly clear and we will never, we will never, we will never use your data to train our models. So the data that you provide in something like Microsoft Copilot will never be used to train any of our models. But importantly, and I'm sure other people provide some of those same reassurances. I don't have a good awareness of the rest of the market. Um, but it's really, really important that you're crystal clear about what you are pasting into a tool and what you sh and what URLs you should block. Because it is all too easy in a clinical space to kind of to have somebody who isn't digitally literate to not quite understand the, impl the implications of their actions and to paste in, can you make this into a table and, uh, and add this column? Here you go, ch uh, chat GPT. Here you go, AN other tool that I don't really understand what it is, but my mate in the pub told me about it. And all of a sudden, you're letting some of those models train on your data that isn't the data you should be sharing. And I think that's really, really challenging with the pace of change and the number of people who've heard from somebody somewhere that AI will make stuff go faster. You just chuck your questions in here. I don't think they've necessarily gone, actually don't chuck your questions in here. Or maybe ask generic questions that relate to the private business stuff slash uh, GDPR P PII that you have. Um, so yeah. If there's one takeaway, then please don't cut and paste your stuff into a system unless you're crystal clear that that will never train on your data. Yeah, yeah. I had a conversation with a, a doctor last week who was saying you don't even have to be able to find WebMD now because people are just <laughs> asking ChatGPT, who then looks on WebMD for you. So see your symptoms. Just ask ChatGPT. <laughs> Well, MD is great. I've diagnosed myself loads of times on that. <laughs> <laughs> My doctor loves me for it. Yeah. <laughs> you have to be rather discerning, though. And that brings us back to that thing of we need to teach people to have really good critical thinking skills and to understand the limits of this stuff so that they don't end up pushing it beyond its limits or pushing it to a place that's unsafe. Yeah. And I love the proof of concept idea, Stephanie, actually giving people access to proof of concept so they can try stuff out. That's just brilliant. That is. I'm very conscious that we're running out of time and Aditya has a question. Um, so I'm going to let him ask his question and then I think we'll have to wrap it up, I'm afraid. So Aditya, do you want to ask your question? Yeah. Sorry uh, for not having my video on. The wind is too much. So I have to save my band. Uh, I, will, I will keep it quick, uh, given the time. Thank you, Stephanie, for coming here. Uh, you talked about design change over the legacy period in your initial talk, right? How we have kind of evolved around the design and how we have accepted some of it. And sometimes you have to build on the old models to perhaps make people more attached to a particular product or solution. However, in the recent time space, what we have seen, sometimes at least the solution providers are coming up and saying, oh, users don't know what they're asking for. Or sometimes they don't know this is their need, right? First of all, where is this philosophy actually coming from? And secondly, I partially believe it could be right. It could be right because sometimes you don't know what you're actually looking for. However, uh, as someone who's trying to develop something like as a process or something, how do you manage such psychological expectations from the user? And my second quick question is, uh, we are seeing the tech world is evolving through and through. Artificial intelligence is coming like our next neighbor and everything is happening. However, how you spoke about Gemba and specifically Gembetsu. So I am from a mechanical engineering background and I am now transitioning towards the tech space. It, it fascinates me to a point that everybody is talking about AI, but nobody is actually talking about what is the problem, <laughs> right? Nobody is talking about what is the problem statement. What are we trying to solve? Like I see all the LinkedIn influencers writing 
new posts every single day coming up about oh this is ai that is ai how you have to do this this is what you have to learn learn um, or data science and everything i'm like sure but what are we trying to solve <laughs> no but right nobody talks about we should do ground zero analysis we should do root cause analysis because when i i just completed my masters i studied from one of the reputed universities in the world right yet i never heard five eyes i never heard 5w or 4w1h and i'm sorry to say but if you're not using such like fundamental points to even curate your problem statements where is actually our tech world is actually evolving is something i just want to understand from your experience of like 20 years now in the space like should we be quite vigilant of it so let's do the last question first i think the reality is saying AI is sexy. So if you go, I'm doing an AI thing, even though actually you were doing, people will assume one, that you mean the new generative, generative AI stuff because it's been in the press. And that is all of a sudden hugely appealing. Whereas if actually what you were doing is aggregating some data, which is what most people are actually doing or getting good governance to enable them to go and aggregate some data so that they could actually do research with a kind of pull and we'll keep the we'll keep the CEO happy because we'll throw in a so that we can get to AI statement fine like the reality is you have to play to your audience right and if somebody's going to sign something off then going we have to do these steps and then we can do the AI bit uh, sometimes that's how you get something signed off because we know that it blew up. It's been all over the press. And the reality is that a whole load of uh, C-suite members and boards who drive and enable you to make decisions want to hear what, you, what you're doing about AI. So you've kind of got to play to those audiences, right? Um, why on earth you wouldn't be doing any of those good practices is frankly concerning. And I think probably one of the best things to do would be to, to ask your line manager, um, demonstrate the benefits of this and ask your line manager. And things like ProSci going from like poor, poor change management being 15% to uh, great change management following the ProSci process demonstrating 83% of the original briefs of the projects. You need to come up with a couple of like snippets like that in the space that you're in that you can demonstrate and it can be in the last you know 20 years but just get crystal clear so and so did this and this was the impact so and so did this and this is the impact this is what i would re this is what i recommend as a way of scoping up as something to add to the scoping of our projects could i go look at that the worst they can say is no like but if you don't if you if you don't articulate it in a way that makes real sense for them to just go yeah okay like oh cool can i take two hours to go and meet with this person to do this thing because i think it might be useful and here's the here's the reasons they might say no and that might be a reason that you think well are they the line manager for me or is this the role for me uh and you know over a long period longer period of time and a few more of those no's you might it might sway you towards that not being the right culture for you uh, it definitely has for me. Um, but I think there are people who do those things. And the other thing about when you've got a change to a product, um, it depends who you are. The reality is when you're in Microsoft, if a large entity in this country, in the public or the private sector, um, needs a feature and has enough <laughs> has enough and has enough demonstrated need uh it is perfectly possible that the product group of the global microsoft company will have meetings to discuss where that feature goes in the roadmap the other thing that everybody has access to is the ability to go and put a re feature request on any microsoft roadmap and i would expect that similar to uh, products of similar sizes in lots of other places too i just don't have huge experience of it you can then get other people to upvote that so if you happen to be in an active community uh especially an active global community where you think or even in one of the chats that relates to a question that someone else asked that you know that that feature would be the answer to 
you can go and publicize that and get other people to vote. Uh, you, if you've got a big YouTube channel uh, about some of this tech stuff and you think that that would be really useful, you can get other people to vote. And therefore, anybody has the freedom to work out how to bump that thing up the priority list uh, within a large tech company. And a lot of people have got similar programs to if you become an expert in a technology, Microsoft has something called the Microsoft uh, Most Valuable Professional Program, the MVP program. Those people get to meet with our product group because a lot of those people live and breathe, whether they're in a technology partner, a consultancy or in an end user organization, get to live and breathe in that solution and the stuff it can and can't do and the stuff you wish it does for years and then when someone's like oh, I've got this thing or that is missing this thing one of those people will be like cool someone mentioned this thing to me and I've been playing it out in my head and actually I think it might be quite useful and that forum enables people who don't necessarily who've like who've got the technical understanding of the solution well enough to be sat at that top table irrespective of they might have lots of little customers rather than have one large organization that gets its own seat at the table. So there's many ways for you to work out, if you're persistent enough, how, how once you become more of an expert in that solution, you can get to that place. But like, it's easy to get frustrated that your thing didn't get done, but it's relatively like within your reach to check and find out if somebody else thinks that that thing is valid and whilst you're learning and therefore to get the feature on a roadmap isn't unthinkable and I think it used to be that thing you know that book was that thick and published like you weren't making a change request to that thing they'd have to go back and reprint those books that I think cost about a thousand pounds uh, you know that isn't the world we're in people are iterating daily on stuff Numerical formulas in C. Mm, I know that one. <laughs> I'm old school. I learned from a manual like that. <laughs> Stephanie, that was absolutely wonderful. I need to have a word with Microsoft about OneDrive. Um, <laughs> but anyway, other than that, <laughs> yeah, you've heard it, haven't you? <laughs> Other than that, thank you so much. It's really, really interesting. I think we've all learned loads. Unfortunately, we're beginning to lose people now. So I think we need to kind of wrap it up. Um, I just say on behalf of myself and Bala, who unfortunately can't can't sound to us, he can put lots of really interesting stuff in the chat, however, which is really good. I do encourage people to read the, um, read the chat comments. Um, and I'm not sure if they're saved, but I know we have a recording of this um, this chat. So I think that will be going up on the um, ORS website, which is fine by you, is it? Is that okay by you, Stephanie, for this chat to go um, up on YouTube? I don't think I've said anything particularly interesting. <laughs> That's great. That's fine. <laughs> Always like to check with our speakers and make sure they don't mind being recorded. Yeah. <laughs> And the recording's going up. So I will just say thank you very much, Stephanie Stacey, for coming and talking to us and telling us all sorts of stuff about uh, Microsoft and um, about human centered design. And I'm definitely going to be getting in touch. I think we need to have a chat. Yeah. And I will just go as a round of applause of one. I'm sure everybody else is doing the same thing, but we can't hear them. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye bye.